Welcome to the world of demons. Forget most of what you think and prepare to relearn the true history of Dark Souls. Our research has been broad and in-depth and anything we hold back is either because of uncertainty we are uncomfortable with or if some insight can be used better for a later lore reveal. I stress now that it is vital you watch the foundation for lore understanding, the timeline video. You can watch it here. You don't learn real history that's not in order, and you will not understand anything if you do not understand the sequence of events in Dark Souls. Watch the foundation, and then move on to these more focused topics. I won't be going into too much justification, as that has been covered in the timeline video. Get ready to be challenged. Our videos are for the lore enthusiasts, so brace yourselves. Demons had a beginning that was unlike the they forms of life that came from the dark. It is widely known that the emergence of demons was later than the gods, or lords. Indeed, the Witch of Isleth is the mother of all demons, so she must exist first. In addition, to attempt to recreate the first flame, she also needed to have found her own lord soul. What is not broadly understood is just how early the creation of the Flame of Chaos was after both of these necessary events. Once she had her lord soul, it was not long after challenging the dragons, and perhaps even before, that the Witch of Isleth attempted to recreate the first flame. I have mentioned in the timeline video that we appear to be watching the ritual of the creation of the Flame of Chaos in the intro. The witch cradles her piece of the first flame, ready to light the kindling at the core of the earth in Isleth. There are also two daughters with staves either side of her, just as we find two magic imbued staves in the boss battle, who likely become part of the bed of chaos. There is also demonic script around these staves, and you see that they are catalysts very clearly when you destroy them and in the short cinematic that follows. This demonic text only appears around the witch, ceaseless discharge, and Quelag, i.e. the witch or her direct offspring. The Witch of Isleth fails in creating an identical copy as intended, creating instead the Chaos Flame. Contrary to popular belief, however, she succeeded in controlling it. It was unstable at first, but she brought it to stability and kept it under control. This is shown by the phrase, wasn't yet stable in the DesignWorks interview, which implies that it became stable after its creation. We also know she controlled it as she produced demons, such as the demon Fire Sage, before the supposed engulfment occurred. The demon Fire Sage was the first demon, and the last master of the original fire arts before the Witch of Isleth was engulfed by chaos, creating pyromancy. This shows that there was a demon before both pyromancy and engulfment. I believe Dark Souls uses the phrase engulfment to mean its secondary definition of powerfully affecting someone or overwhelming. It does not mean being flooded over by the Chaos Flame or by lava, which is what most imagine. I believe that the witch gave in to her desire for the demonic, for corrupting forces such as sadness and anger, and committed fully to demonhood emotionally. She didn't lose control of the flame, rather, she lost control of herself. I will get to what may have caused this in a moment. The lava that floods the area actually comes from Ceaseless and his sores, further supporting the idea that the obvious notion of engulfment is incorrect. After the flame stabilizes, the witch then decides to create demons. This was not a manic production beyond her control, but an active choice. She had Ceaseless while the flame was still unstable, and continues to become the mother of others after it is stable. Only Ceaseless is covered with chaos sores, as other demons were born from a stable flame. However, most demons are not produced in the same biological sense as the witch's daughters in Ceaseless, and perhaps other sons, where I believe there was a father. She may have been pregnant with Ceaseless during the time when the Chaos Flame was created, explaining why Ceaseless was born while the Flame was unstable, and yet was still a true sibling of Quelana and her sisters. All demons have the witch as their mother, but in most cases it was not in the same sense as Ceaseless, her daughters, or perhaps her other sons. Instead, she bound beings together through the Chaos Flame, or produced the parasites which would allow the host to become a demon. The Guardian Soul supports this, stating that the Guardian is akin to a demon, in that it seems to be formed of more than one creature. A parasite is created from the Chaos Flame, and given, or applied, to a host. A successful demon amalgamation would be achieved once the parasite had truly merged with the host. She nurtured them as this process went on, shown by the Japanese name for the Bed of Chaos, which translates to Nursery of Chaos. That the life of the Chaos Flame produced was parasitic, and needed to merge with a host is no surprise. Let us consider what the Chaos Flame is. It was produced through a piece of the First Flame. The Chaos Flame could not be in existence without the First Flame. It is, in a sense, dependent on the First Flame. That is to say, it's parasitic. The First Flame brought life, true life, 
Therefore, what form of life would the Chaos Flame create? The first flame creates life, and the chaos flame, which is dependent on the first flame, creates life, which is dependent on true life, parasitic life. The beings the bed of chaos creates have just the same relationship with living beings as the flame of chaos has with the first flame. The chaos flame also feeds on humanity, so in the same way that a parasite feeds off its host, the flame itself must absorb pieces of the first flame to continue. Therefore, the sisters of chaos, the egg bearers and the crag spiders are all examples of welded creatures through original forms and parasitic ones that have fused. Cut content shows a brain bug which seems to progress along several stages of parasitic fusing to reach the crag spider. The chaos sisters were once humanoid and now are welded. The egg bearers are hosts and we ourselves can become like them. The cut content has an item which refers to the parasite you can receive from the egg bearers. The description states that an egg implanted on the head by a type of parasite bearing eggs on the back. The nightmare begins with a slight itch of the head, and soon the parasite will be siphoning the souls of slain enemies. Siphoning the souls. It becomes part of you, and eventually you work together as one creature. Even the witch herself, at her very core, has a parasitic insect. It is so fused with her that to fully kill her, to get the witch's very soul, it also needs to be killed. It also appears as though it exhausts her, with the witch slumped over with the toll the parasite takes on her, a relationship where she can't live without it and yet it costs her dearly, an addiction to chaos. There is likely more to her broken, defeated physicality that I will get to shortly. Some time after the birth of Ceaseless, some of her daughters elected, of their own free will, to become the spider demons we meet. I believe that it was likely they were gifted with special parasites that the chaos flame produced. They slowly fuse with these parasites and grow into the half-spider, half-witch creatures that we encounter. There was no panicked mutation where the beautiful, innocent daughters became grotesque monsters. Most demonic production was a result of choice. There is a great deal of evidence for this, simply by looking at the behaviour the demons exhibit while playing Dark Souls. Right up to the present day, Quelag, her sister, and all the demons, except a small group who betrayed their kind, are pro-demon survival, growth, and flourishing, and protect the Chaos Flame. They have no wish to revert back to any former state, and in fact wish more demons to be born. Anyone who says otherwise, even if it happens to be another daughter of Chaos, is lying. To realise this, we must simply notice the signs that have always been there. First is that during the witch's control of the Chaos Flame, she produces and becomes the mother of many demons before either pyromancy or engulfment comes about. The witch was perfectly in control. Engulfment was a dedication or addiction to the demonic at all costs due to a later event. The demons enjoyed a flourishing culture before both the engulfment and pyromancy. This means that the witch was choosing to have the demon offspring. Quelana stays in Isleth for some time after demons are produced. We know this, as she doesn't leave until some time after her brother is born, grows, is gifted a ring, drops it and so on, as shown by Ceaseless mourning what he believes to be her body. The description of the orange child ring shows Ceaseless was gifted the ring by his sisters, i.e. the whole group of them, not a portion of them, with one missing. Similarly, Ceaseless is referred to by Miyazaki as the first demon. Therefore, he must be born before his sisters become the spider demons we meet. So Quelana cannot flee with the knowledge of her sisters being spider demons without also knowing of Ceaseless. All these things show that Quelana does not leave Isolith as the Chaos Flame is created and that it is controlled. Eventually, Quelana does leave, however, faking her death for the sake of her brother and forsaking the rest of her family. She does this after the Lords challenge the dragons, but well before the war against the demons and either just before the Age of Fire, or just after it comes about. With regards to Ceaseless, there is no evidence that Ceaseless was the only son. He is just the only son there is proof for. The potential for other brothers also chimes with the idea that Vamos could have been from Isolith, and from the same royal line. With golden yellow on his helm, demonic tendril bones on his face, a knowledge of how to use ancient embers that were lost to Isolith, and a royal bloodline. Furthermore, there is a Prince Isleth in the game text files, which I will get to in a moment. More evidence of this loyalty to demonhood held by all, except Quelana and the Batwing demons, is the culture that is shown everywhere. It is easy to disregard it when faced with the animalistic nature of the demons. We assume they are lowly beasts, and that the surrounding culture must have been before the onset of demons, and a vestige of Isleth. Rather, Isleth has demon culture at its core, from the demonic statues to the bed of chaos at Isolith's deepest point. 
Demon culture is all around us, and it brought new forms of magic, lifted this art to chaos form over time, and developed smithing. The old witch's ring shows that there is not only a spoken language, but a written language as well. Using the ring, we can speak this demonic language with the fair lady. The script of this language is not only on the ring, but on the space where faces should be on the titanite demons, flowing up around ceaseless discharge, quailag, and the staves either side of the bed of chaos. In addition to language, they have a social hierarchy, from lesser Taurus and Capra demons, lesser Batwing demons, to a Fire Sage, whose name literally means Flame Priest, which is close enough to Fire Sage. What's interesting is that the way his name is arranged means he is Flame Priest to the demons, not just another demon who happens to be a priest. It indicates a much higher authority in the demonhood than your average animal demon, and shows he holds a high station amongst the demons. Furthermore, his name shows that there was a demon religion that he had a high standing in, a stamp of even existential questions in the culture. This hierarchy goes right up to the witch, the Queen of Isolith. In addition, the basement key advises us to be wary of the dogs that serve the Capra demon, implying the demons have the intelligence to train lesser beings. The existence of this developed demon culture in society is further supported by the DesignWorks interview. At one point, Miyazaki is asked by an artist about putting symbols into the design successfully. Miyazaki praises the demon designs and says that the symbols worked well, mentioning that the Capra demon's head is an example of this. It gives a sense of ceremony and long-held tradition which in turn hints at developed culture. From software, as they always do, merely hint. But look and you shall find, and developed culture it is. Developed enough to grow in all these ways, have language, religion, wage war with Gwyn, resolve it in pacts, and when the four kings default on their agreement and the humanity cycle stops working, the demons are wise enough to attempt to stop Frampton Gwyndolin's expedient solution of the undead legend. The demons are aware that Frampton Gwyndolin believe that the Witch of Isleth has outlived her usefulness, therefore they act in the interest of self-preservation. They attempt to stop the progress of any undead in order to protect their queen and mother. This is shown by the fact that the Capra demon has made his way into the undead burg to halt your progress. The Taurus too, with the bridge smashed up enough to show he has stopped a great deal of us advancing already. These are both recent developments, as shown by the undead merchant dialogue, who states that it has gotten treacherous in these parts, and that demons have moved in. This pairs perfectly with the recent creation of the undead legend. In addition, the DesignWorks interview reveals that the centipede demon was originally intended to guard the first bell, which is another example of the demon stopping us fulfilling the prophecy, with demons protecting both bells. The undead asylum is also guarded by an asylum demon, who fights to stop the passage of the undead fleeing to follow the legend. They have their own intentions and motivations, and they work together as a community with a shared plan. From one of the oldest demons in existence showing that religion and sorcery existed all those years ago, right up to the present day their culture has survived. The lords rose and fell, the dragons are no more, but the demons are still unified and very much alive. Therefore the demons are not monsters or animals, but have an interest in going on living and maintaining their culture, and they certainly don't want to be put out of their misery, as Quelana implies. Let us move back to the first stages of demonhood and focus on the Daughters of Chaos. Evidence that becoming a spider demon was a choice, and not being caught in a chaos flame growing out of control, is evident through the fact that Quelana and the eldest daughter are still human. All the daughters were close to their mother, and likely took part in the ritual. In fact, we find the eldest daughter closer to the chaos flame than anyone else, far below her spider sisters, and yet, she is still human. This was not luck, or fleeing in time, since she is still at the heart of chaos and she's wielding its magic. The eldest daughter did not flee, and is not a demon. Therefore, those who didn't transform exercised a free choice to not do so. There is no engulfment, but rather an emotional engulfment, a willingness to be subsumed. Demon is a modern spelling of the word demon, which is defined as, in ancient Greek belief, a divinity or supernatural being of a nature between gods and humans. This fits with a great deal of Greek mythology inspiration that is present in Dark Souls. It also fits with another foundational inspiration for Dark Souls, Berserk. I advise you to skip forward if you wish to read or watch any Berserk and you don't want to hear any spoilers. In Berserk, there is a moment where Guts is talking to Griffith about the shock of seeing a demon, something they wouldn't have believed to have existed just days before. Griffith says to Guts, I would say that it could be something like a god, to which Guts says, more like a demon. Griffith replies, who knows, is there a difference? Here is the series episode, where he says this about 10 minutes in. 
or, alternatively, the scene is at the end of book 5 of the manga. This implies, or reveals the concept of, who is to say there should be a distinction between such levels of power? Why should becoming a spider demon be less compelling than becoming a lord in Dark Souls? Because it's more grotesque aesthetically? The Guardian Soul description also mentions that the Guardian is like the beings known as demons because he is an amalgamation of creatures. The phrase known as implies that the term demon is not a necessary or true name. They are not inherently demonic or monstrous as the negative term implies. Instead, it is the term used by those who view them as monsters. In the lands of humans or lords, they may use this term to animalize or demean the inhabitants of Isolith to the level of senseless beasts, rather than those who have a flourishing culture and may match Lordran's might. If we look at Berserk once more, we find further support by discovering that every demon in Berserk chose to become one. All minor demons and all members of the God Hand, including Griffith, chose power and forsook their humanity. In a similar way, I believe that Quelag, her sister the Fair Lady, and many others chose to transform. I believe the only one without a choice was Ceaseless Discharge, who was born so early that the witch did not have full control of the flame yet. This would make even more sense if she was pregnant when creating the flame, or gave birth when it was unstable. In Berserk, Casca is pregnant when she is overcome by demonhood, and her child is born demonic and malformed. Once again, Ceaseless is likely the same, an unfortunate case of timing, and I believe this to be why Quelana pities him. This is why she takes the trouble when she leaves to trick him into thinking she has died, when actually she has forsaken them all. She also does not request him to be killed, perhaps the only one who would actually want to be put out of his misery. Though she is quick to invoke this concept for her sisters, who are in no pain other than those caused by the human realm. When looking at Berserk, those who wish to become demons must sacrifice something dear to them, something that they love the most. Perhaps this is why Quelana finally felt she had to leave and forsake her family, since she couldn't abide by these actions. Even if the two stays by the Bed of Chaos are two of the Chaos Sisters, there is still one sister that is unaccounted for. It does beg the question of what happened to her with regards to these sacrifices that may have been made. Perhaps this explains Quelana's wishes for only putting certain members of her family out of their misery. This is speculation though, of course. In addition to the definition of demon, Inspiration from Greek mythology and Berserk Let us look at more direct evidence for demons having wished to become demons. What about the present day, though? Everyone we encounter, except Quelana, are in support of the Chaos Flame, demons, and even creating more demons. What is Ceaseless Discharge doing in addition to looking over the corpse of his sister? He is looking over the Chaos Flame. What does Quelag do when you enter the boss room? She pats her demonic half affectionately. During the fight, she hugs herself to cast a spell. She is affectionate to her demon side, and does not view it as a curse. What does Kirk do in addition to collecting humanity? He serves the wishes of the fair lady. He may even be in love with her. What does he die doing? He protects the bed of chaos, to the very end. What is the name of the covenant that you can join? The servants of chaos. What do you give to it in the fair lady? Humanity reinforcing the concept of demons being between gods and humans. What happens to chaos weapons is you add humanity. They become stronger, just as the demons in Berserk do with human sacrifice. The fair lady unlocks a shortcut to Isolith, and Kirk can reach it. They are residing where they stay by choice, not because they fled, as Quelana claims. They guard the bell in order to protect their mother, so they have made their home higher up. What does the eldest daughter die doing? Protecting the bed of chaos. What can you undertake as a member of the Servants of Chaos, and what does Ingi congratulate you for? Becoming a host for a parasite. What does the item egg vermifuge state? That the egg bearers have chosen to serve the Flame of Chaos. What does the Fair Lady say to you when she believes you are her sister? Sister, it hurts. The eggs have gone still. I fear it may be too late. I'm so sorry, dear sister. The fair lady wishes the eggs and parasites, all potential future demons, to live and grow and multiply. Are any of these long lists the actions of those who are mutated against their will? Rather, it seems they are happy to be in this state, and are actively worshipping and protecting the flame responsible. They are constantly working on creating more demons, and are deeply sad when potential eggs may have died. All this contributes to a resounding message, the demons are exactly what they want to be and they want more demons to come into existence. 
Let us talk briefly about the influence of pyromancy on the world outside of Isolith. Quelana learns the language of Lordran, and long after leaving Isolith, teaches pyromancy to Salomon. Laurentius's sash has language on it that looks akin to demonic runes. Perhaps this shows that Laurentius is a student, or of the same student-teacher lineage as Quelana, Salomon, and Carmina. Blighttown, however, is not the same as the Great Swamp. This is for several reasons. First, and this piece of evidence is sufficient proof alone, Laurentius needs to be told where to find Quelana and how to get to the base of Blighttown, by you. He is from the Great Swamp, so it should be easy to return home if the Swamp and Blighttown were one and the same. He has travelled far to get to Lordran from the Great Swamp since becoming undead. Far is not from Blighttown to Firelink. In addition to this, he goes hollow in Blighttown, which implies that he was not capable of traversing it. It is doubtful Laurentius could not survive a stay at his own home. His hollowing may have been more complex, however, but I will get to that. Further proof is that we find the poison mist pyromancy on a corpse in the swamp at the base of Blighttown. We know Ingi and others were cast out from the Great Swamp as heretics for such pyromancy. It is therefore unlikely that those who were exiled died in the very place they were banished from. Further evidence is that Siegmeier calls Blighttown the Poison Swamp, not the Great Swamp. The tattered cloth manchette also states that pyromancers were driven out into hinterlands, the definition of which is an area lying beyond what is visible or known. Right below Firelink Shrine is unlikely to be a hinterland, and this item is also found along with the spell of an exile, further confirming that Blighttown is not this hinterland. Finally, there has been a lineage of pyromancers in the Great Swamp, but we find no one but Quelana in Blighttown. Laurentius tells us that he imagines his teacher still resides in the Great Swamp, yet we find no such teacher in Blighttown. Also, as discussed in the timeline video, there is one healer of New Londo who originates from Blighttown and returns to it after giving up on her duty. And we know pyromancy only emerged to the outside world via Salomon not long before the Four Kings were trapped. Therefore, it is unlikely that Blighttown is the Great Swamp if it is already populated so soon after pyromancy has been taught to Salomon. Laurentius also mentions that his home, the Great Swamp, is a great store of nature, and Blighttown certainly does not seem this way. A swamp can be a fertile marshland, not a poison bog. Blighttown is stagnant, and has no store of life at all. Finally, Laurentius says to us that in this land, i.e. Lordran, pyromancers earn a certain respect. Therefore, the land of Lordran is distinct from the land which holds the Great Swamp within it. Let us focus now solely on Quelana. We have established that she leaves after challenging the dragons, but before the Age of Fire truly comes about, or certainly not far into it. This is well before Chaos Pyromancy developed, as she has not learnt any. This may be why she is referenced as having latent power, as she has not yet learnt to invoke Chaos Flame. But why does she leave? Perhaps she feels that becoming a demon is a mistake. Perhaps she falls out with her sisters. It is difficult to know, but I believe it is not an amicable departure, and that she resents or even hates her mothers and sisters, perhaps her father also. She fakes her death when she leaves, likely for the sake of her brother, Ceaseless, who did not choose his fate and was a demon by birth. She leaves for some time, but other than the teaching of Salomon and perhaps an involvement with the war, what does she get up to? We find her at the base of a poison swamp. Not a place to live by choice, surely. So what is she doing very close to the realm of her sisters? This may be answered by examining what she asks us to do. She requests that we put her mother and sisters out of their misery. However, I have established her sisters are in no misery, except through a poison introduced from outside their realm. This benevolence of Quelana's appears questionable when Quelag is happy as a demon. Even non-demons, Kirk and the eldest daughter of Chaos, die protecting the Witch of Isolet. So. Quelana begins to seem more suspect. What is more suspect is that she omits asking us to put Ceaseless Discharge out of his misery, despite her brother undoubtedly living in constant pain. Finally, if you return having completed her morbid request, her reaction speaks volumes. Quelana's first words, after you killed her mother, and they are calmly spoken, are, Outstanding. You have done very well. This is not the emotional response expected from a daughter hearing her mother is dead, however much misery the mother may have been in. This coldness may reveal the desire to do harm that the kind voice and intelligence of Quelana masks from us. Perhaps we were charmed, and charmed may be the right word here, as we are dealing with a witch. Let us think for a moment about the pain the fair lady is in. 
This came from outside of Quelag's domain. It came about from Quelana teaching pyromancy to the outside world, perhaps much later, but the poison pyromancy would not have come about without Quelana teaching Salomon all those years ago. But look closer. Just how indirect was the poisoning of the fair lady? How responsible is Quelana really? Ingi asks us in his dialogue whether we have heard of lost Quelana, and yet mentions that no one has ever seen her. He does not speak the language of the fair lady, so how would he know of Quelana's existence? Indeed, Quelana faked her death, so it is likely that Quelag and the fair lady do not even know that their sister is alive. So how does Ingi have a knowledge about this invisible witch? He may not even know how he knows. Ingi poisoned the fair lady through her self-sacrifice, but was it by chance that he bungled into Quelag's lair? Let us look at the final piece of the puzzle, an item Quelana sells. Undead Rapport. This is a pyromancy which charms undead and gains temporary allies. It makes them spellbound, witless, and under her control. In addition, this is an advanced pyromancy of Quelana. She not only sells it, she invented it. What business does she have manipulating the undead? Why would someone feigning ablution concern themselves with undead mind control? Why is enchanting the undead so important that she would go to the length of creating a spell? The spell also mentions, despite there being no gender mechanic in Dark Souls, that it is usable by either gender. This implies that Quelana created it and has been using it as it has worked for the female gender in the past. Now, Quelana permanently lurking outside her sister's domain seems more sinister. What happens when we tell Laurentius where to find Quelana? We find him later, apparently hollow. As Laurentius showed in his dialogue that he was pro the Witch of Isolith, perhaps Quelana did not take kindly to him. Did he go hollow through his own incompetence, or was he enchanted? Wandering around the swamp, spellbound by a daughter of chaos, until poison overcame him. Laurentius may have been just another victim of Quelana's, turned away from Isolith due to his esteem for the witch. Ingi now seems not coincidental at all. Quelana funneled a poison-bearing Ingi towards her sisters with evil intent. Her sister does not die, so later she sends a violent, chosen undead who specialises in killing lords. Ingi may have invented the poison that afflicts the fair lady, but Quelana directed the poison and Ingi into her domain. In the same way that the undead we use undead rapport on wake back up after a time, Ingi does the same, having no idea what happened and becoming truly loyal to the fair lady. However, perhaps some vague memory does remain. What proof of his interaction with Quelana could there be if there is only a subconscious flicker left? It is shown to us by his knowledge of Quelana. How could he know of her without some interaction? He cannot speak the language of his mistresses, yet asks if we have heard of a lost Quelana, who no one has ever seen, a witch wandering the poison swamp. He hasn't seen her, yet he knows of her, as her mind possessed his. Perhaps even Salomon was bewitched too. Quelana herself admits Salomon was bungling. Perhaps he was chosen not for his great competence, but for his great incompetence and potential to be manipulated. And finally, we have ourselves. A foolish undead, rolling amongst the swamp, pursuing a false undead legend. We are charmed into doing Quelana's bidding and used to murder her family. Hers is the only web of the Daughters of Chaos that we are truly caught in, and we become just another fool. Let us return to the run-up to the war that occurs between Chaos Demons and Laudron. It is likely that the demon consumption of humanity was a competition for resources, until the lack of supply was such that Gwyn went to war with the demons. It is likely consumption increased with the growth of the population of demons. A pact was reached after the battle to keep to their respective realms, or enforced when Gwyn gained the upper hand. He may have done this with Quelana's help, as a defector, translator, or intermediary. Whether it was through Quelana's help or not, Laudron gained the upper hand by bringing over to their side the demons we find in Analonda. We can tell these demons defected to Gwyn through the description of their spear, their presence in Analondo, and their use of lightning. They are named lesser demons, so likely did not rank highly in the society of Isolith, and therefore were likely to rebel to a society which promised to treat them better. 
Their weapon explicitly states that they are Chaos Demons, so their natural home is down below, in Isolith. It also states that their weapons are imbued with lightning. Lightning is a gift Gwyn bestows, and every other normal demon weapon is referenced as only having a great weight or power if used with great strength. The Bat Demons are once again unique. Finally, these demons help you progress to Anolondo, carrying you up. Every other demon tries to stop you in the path that ends with the death of their mother. We can therefore conclude that these demons betrayed their kind for Gwyn, much as Seath did against the dragons. The tide turned with the betrayal of these demons, perhaps with the help of Quelana to translate their secrets. The demons finally conceded to a pact after it was evident that they had to compromise or be defeated as the dragons were. The pacts likely involved humanity consumption and keeping to their realm, just as Quelag mentions in her cut dialogue. Keeping to different realms would also fix the competition for humanity. Finally, the Bell Quelag Guards served a purpose before its use as a part of the Undead Legend. It was likely linked to offerings for the Four Kings, or to send a signal when they required more humanity from the production line overseen by the Four Kings. You may have noticed that we have been led to the question of a father and a king. I believe that the father of the daughters, and likely some sons too, was Xanthus King Jeremiah. Let us first analyse the name. Xanthus is not a place, but in fact means yellow. This is misleading, and often causes people to conclude that he is from some exotic, unknown part of the land. It simply refers to the colour of the clothes he wears. King, of course, implies he was a king, but this requires a kingdom. The name Jeremiah may help us in finding this kingdom. Jeremiah is the name of a major Hebrew prophet who foresaw the fall of Assyria and the conquest of his country by Egypt and Babylon. This name implies that he could be from Isolith, and warns Isolith of the potential invasion by Lordran. Isolith was invaded by another power just as Assyria was. Tenuous? Let's go further. Jeremiah also wields Chaos Pyromancies, pyromancies which even Quelana does not wield, as she left before Pyromancy had developed to the Chaos level. What Chaos Pyromancy does he also wield that is exclusive to only one other character? Chaos Fire Whip, wielded by the eldest daughter of the Witch of Isolith, the daughter that is the deepest in supposedly lost Isolith. It is assumed that she created it as she wields it, but equally, the spell could have been a gift from her father. Whichever way you look at it, it is a remarkably rare spell, and it certainly implies a connection. Furthermore, if King Jeremiah is exiled, where is he exiled from? Given his strong links to pyromancy, and access to chaos pyromancies, the obvious answer is Isolith. What is Isolith lacking? A king, and father to the daughters. There is also further support in previous works of From Software. In Demon Souls, some of you may remember the old monk boss, the old monk's robe, which becomes a headpiece, is remarkably similar to the one King Jeremiah wears. This has often been referred to as a little nod to fans of Demon Souls, but there is more here. In Demon Souls, the King of Latria has been kicked out of the kingdom by the Queen, and he also uses this yellow cloth in the boss battle. This once again implies that Jeremiah not only looks like the old monk boss battle by chance, but reflects the lore behind the story in Demon Souls as well. Both characters were exiled from the land by their queens, in fact, the Bed of Chaos boss battle was almost very similar to the Demon Souls Old Monk battle too. Waragi stated in the DesignWorks interview that in a previous version, the Bed of Chaos lies sprawled on the floor and waves its hands, while the King sitting on the throne looks on. Miyazaki confirms this and talks about later changes. Just like in the Old Monk fight, where the King on the throne does not actually fight you while a PvPer controlled by the headcloth fights the player, this old version of the Bed of Chaos boss battle is similar. The Bed of Chaos fights while the king sits. The cloth, the format of the battle, the lore, and the missing king all match. And then we have his appearance in the Painted World. Miyazaki has said that the Painted World was a place where they put ideas that were cut from the game, or semi-cut, which they still wanted to have. Perhaps he just couldn't let go of his good ideas. We know that there was a King Isolith that was cut from the DesignWorks interview and a king appears in the Painted World. This king was cut at a very late moment, so they would have become attached to the character, its design and the lore surrounding it. It is likely, therefore, that it would be placed in the Painted World. He also mentions that the Painted World is a place where someone who's being chased to might go to escape, 
and references Priscilla while saying this. However, in the same way, the painted world also suits our exiled King Jeremiah. Furthermore, the wall-hugging parasite in Blighttown in the text files is called Prince Isolith. It has been frequently mentioned that perhaps this enemy could be more than it appears. This could be another son, like Ceaseless, overwhelmed by a demon parasite. He guards power within on a corpse, so the prince is not Carmina, but this pyromancy does emphasize the concept of excessive power, eating away the life force of its caster, rather like the power of demonhood. The shape of the prince's head matches with his potential father. There is also a whip near this Prince Isoleth. And what does King Jeremiah wield? A whip. Like father, like son. Jeremiah is the only character to wield a whip in the game. A notched whip, which is effective against flesh. Perfect for fighting demons, or keeping those he ruled over under control. And what does Ceaseless Discharge appear to use as another son of Jeremiah? It may be his arm, but it is certainly whip-like, a long, single limb that flies down the canyon. The king taught his sons how to fight. Also, look closely at Jeremiah's headscarf. Look at the design work's images. Underneath this yellow bandage is blood and strange spikes or threads that seem to come from within. This isn't a fashion choice, it's hiding something. Underneath is a demon growth just like the Prince Isolith enemy. He has partaken of the fruits of the flame of chaos and is welded with a parasite. From Software passively confirms this through the game code. This is because the headpiece is not able to be removed. Every character's face can be discovered and the headpiece is removed to reveal what lies underneath except a notable few. From Software worked on designing faces even though they knew most people would never see or appreciate them. True Dark Souls. However, in the notable exceptions, From Software does not want to give such easy solutions to lore questions. For these few, the helms are not removable. Jeremiah, Kieran, and Marvelous Chester cannot be seen without their helms. Chester is cursed, so it has become his face. Kieran may or may not be a cyclops of some form, and Dark Souls isn't going to give an easy answer. The face the community touts as being Kieran's was a placeholder model for a demo or debug, and hence it is completely basic, bald, and without features. In the actual game, there is no face that you can access. We are deliberately left in the dark, so we have to reach our own conclusions on our own merit. Then there is Jeremiah, another deliberately held back face model. Why? Because underneath the cloth is not a simple face, but a grotesque growth, much like that found on the Prince Isolith enemy. To allow us to see this demonic growth would give us the law that he is the King of Isolith too easily. However, if Jeremiah was living in Isolith long enough to learn Chaos Pyromancies, what led him to be exiled? I have already mentioned that he may have just been acting under his namesake. After predicting the war would come, his queen and all of Isolith may have become tired of him croaking like a Cassandra, but this is too simplistic. We have another possibility. The queen exiled him because he betrayed her. We have established that the queen must have exiled him due to the fact that she would be the only one with such authority in Isolith. Who else could exile the king? This is further confirmed through the demon soul similarities but there is more support for betrayal in examining what Jeremiah wears. Covered in bright yellow, the headpiece formed a painful embrace that stings the eyes, which reminds us of another character. Lord Trek, clad in burnished gold, with arms that protect him and yet appear to entrap him, have a similar yellow melancholy to his outfit. Lord Trek is, or was, in love with Fina. We know from the Ring of Favour and Protection that Fina possesses fateful beauty, we can also infer, from the fact that the ring breaks if removed, that she is fickle with her affections. It is likely this fickle nature meant it was inevitable that her beauty would affect many men and gods, and she would not keep to one admirer. The fact that we can acquire another ring of favour and protection from Snugly in a single playthrough confirms this, proving that she gave her affections to multiple individuals. Which leads into further evidence for Jeremiah's betrayal of his queen. It is worth noting, however, that the witch may not be without sin either. We think that the father of Ceaseless is in fact someone other than Jeremiah, but I shall expand on that in our Stories of the Gods episode. The item required to give Snugly if you wish to receive Fina's Ring of Favour and Protection is the Xanthus Crown. The more we have studied the lore, the more Snugly's choices of gifts seem non-random, but planned by the developers as links to confirm lore that is buried very deeply. 
The story of Lautrec is surely too inconsequential to have the fateful consequences that are mentioned in the Ring of Favor and Protection. Instead, Jeremiah fell for Fina's beauty, and this love and betrayal of the Witch of Isleth was discovered. The Queen, heartbroken, exiled him. But the fateful consequences did not stop there. The betrayal led to corrupting emotions of sadness and anger, which in turn led to the engulfment that is mentioned. This caused an exponential growth of the demons and the inevitable war, as the witch indulged in chaos, throwing caution to the wind. Fina's beauty may have led to the chain of events, much like in Berserk, with the broken individual choosing demonhood and power over all else. The bed of chaos we meet, head lolling on the floor, arms barely raised, strikes one as defeated and heartbroken. She may have preferred to bring on war and calamity than go on, committing to demonhood in order to flee from the pain her humanity caused her.